inspiration and profound understanding of human mind, body. Through your pioneering work in the field of integrative medicine, you have touched the lives of millions around the globe, guiding them towards a path of wellness, balance and inner peace. Your holistic approach to health are in, and insightful teachings have been a beacon of light for those seeking to unlock their true potential and embrace a life of vitality. Born in New Delhi, Dr. Chopra's background includes training in both traditional Western medicine and Ayurveda, an ancient system of medicine from India, of course. After completing his medical education from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Dr. Chopra immigrated to the United States in the 1970s. He initially worked as a phys physician and specialized in internal medicine. And as his perspective on health and healing began to evolve, he became interested in the connections between the mind, body, body and spirit. Dr. Chopra became a prominent figure in the New Age movement and gained widespread recognition through his best-selling books, lectures and appearances on television and in media, media, including the Oprah Winfrey Show. He has written over 80 books, including Ageless Body, Timeless Mind and The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, which have been translated into multiple languages and sold millions of copies worldwide. Dr. Chopra has founded the Chopra Foundation, a non-profit organization dedicated to research and education in mind-body medicine. He has also co-founded the Chopra Center for Wellbeing, which offers programs and retreats focused on spiritual growth, mind-body healing, and personal transformation. He has been recognized with numerous awards and honors for his contributions to the field of alternative medicine and spirituality. He continues to be a prominent voice in the discussion of integrative medicine, consciousness and well-being. And his work has inspired mil millions of people around the world. As we embark on this enlightening journey today, I encourage each and every one of you to open your hearts and minds to the profound insights and teachings that will be shared today. Let us, uh, be, uh, let us seize the moment to reflect on the immense potential within ourselves and recognize the interconnectedness that binds us all. May our time together be filled with moments of inspiration, transformation, and a renewed sense of purpose. I will like to acknowledge a very special friend and colleague, Mr. Vipin Bakshi here. Uh, who made this event possible. Thank you so much. Once again, I extend a warm welcome to Dr. Deepak Chopra and all the esteemed guests gathered here today. Thank you for gracing us with your presence and let us embark on this incredible journey of knowledge and self-discovery together. Thank you so much. in the back, right? Clear? Yeah, this is better. Okay. Well, happy Doctor's Day. And uh, thank you, uh, Vipin Bakshi. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathur, uh, Bridge Bakshi, and all of you, distinguished doctors, on this wonderful day of celebration. So, um, I will share some ideas on well-being with you, particularly the future of well-being and also how it applies to our profession uh, uh, because 
we are, our profession is supposedly in charge of well-being. Uh, let me start off by saying that well-being is not the same thing as wellness. Okay, wellness is what we measure uh, when we see a patient. Blood pressure, cholesterol levels, biological markers and so on. Well-being on the other hand includes wellness but it's also a state of consciousness. It's a state of uh, awareness. So for the last uh, 40 years, uh, I have worked uh, as uh, on the science uh, advisory board of the Gallup organization. You may be familiar with Gallup. Uh, they are well known in the world for uh, doing world polls, but particularly for predicting the outcome of elections. They did misfire uh, when Mr. Trump was elected. They, they did not predict it quite accurately, but by and large, they do a very good uh, survey on well-being as well. In fact, they are uh, probably the number one organization for measuring well-being in the world. And uh, they do well-being as uh, measured uh, in corporations, in communities, but also in countries. So well-being is overarching well-being, not just physical well-being. So some of the buckets of well-being that they define, uh, one is corporate well-being, okay, business well-being. And that applies to hospital institutions as well. So in corporate well-being, what they look at or what the Gallup organization looks at, and I have been helping them for the last 40 years, is the quality of leadership in a corporation or in a business or in an institution like this. And what is clear is that uh, businesses or corporations or institutions where the leader has shared vision, where there is emotional and spiritual bonding between the team, where there is maximum diversity of talent, but also gender, ethnicity, and so on, and where there is uh, uh, a desire to elevate the whole organization through distributed leadership, those organizations are extremely successful. One of the things that came out very clearly is that if the leader ignores somebody, an employee or a team, a member of the team, if they ignore them, then the rate of disengagement goes up by something like 45%. If on the other hand, the leader or the manager or whoever is in charge, um, instead of ignoring their employee, they criticize them, then the rate of disengagement actually falls from 45% to 20%. Because people would rather be criticized than ignored. At least now you exist. Okay, you're noticed. But if the leader notices a single strength, one strength authentically, you, you did a good job and this is how you did a good job. This is what we observed. This is the need you fulfilled and this is how we feel about it and thank you. The rate of disengagement falls to less than 1%. In the United States, we know that we lose about $300 billion every year from disengaged and actively disengaged people in the workforce because of poor leadership. If you have a best friend at work, your happiness will go up by 15%. And if the best friend has a best friend, the happiness score will go up by another 10% and so on. So that's just a few insights into what we call corporate leadership and well-being, corporate well-being. The second bucket of well-being that is measured is uh, social well-being. Both 
in your profession, but otherwise. So do you have people in your life who care about you, who are there to help you, that you can actually be safe in trusting them? And so social well-being, both at home, with friends, with family, with professional colleagues is also something that can be measured. The third bucket that is measured is uh, physical well-being, quality of your sleep, exercise, nutrition, many things, and I can talk about that. But physical well-being is something also that can be measured. The fourth category is what we call financial well-being. And financial well-being doesn't have to do with the amount of money, but how safe you feel. Do you have insurance? Uh, if you get sick, uh, then is there someone to take care of you? Do you have adequate time for taking a vacation? Do you get some teaching uh, in your profession? All of that is considered you know, financial well-being as well. And uh, so that is also very important. And then the fifth bucket is community well-being. Community well-being, you know, whether your community is your profession, that's part of your community, but it's also where you live. How safe do you feel? If you lose your wallet, will somebody return it to you, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, these are five buckets which are very measurable, and now we are also measuring spiritual well-being. And if you put them all together, then we can measure them on a scale of 1 to 10. So 1 would be miserable, and 10 would be ecstatic. If somebody is asked only one question, only one question, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much energy do you feel every day to do everything that you want? On a scale of 1 to 10, how much energy do you feel to do everything that you want? And if you intuitively say 8, 9, and 10, you don't have to think about it, okay, because you know how you feel, then you're thriving, your future is very good. If you say six or seven, you're struggling in some area. Maybe you're not getting enough sleep. Maybe you're having a marital uh, discord. Maybe your children are not what you expected them to be, etc., etc. Everything influences your state of energy. So if you s say six, seven, you're struggling. And if you say less than five, you're suffering. And you probably already have some chronic illness, just on that one question. But you can apply that question to all these areas, corporate well-being, social well-being, physical well-being, community well-being, financial well-being, and then you can get a total score. It's more involved than I told you, but I've given you a brief summary. Based on this, then we do world polls. And right now, uh, if you do the world poll, you'll see that Scandinavian countries come on the top. And then, you know, there are some, actually, some other countries also that score very high. Um, not only Scandinavian countries, but, you know, uh, a couple of countries in Central America, etc. Uh, even though we think of Russia, e China, India as economic giants now, emerging giants, on well-being, we are not scoring that well at the moment because, you know, large population, India is more than a billion people now, and, you know, middle class is rising slowly and fast, but because there is still a lot of poverty, uh, well-being is not on a high level at the moment. And that's something that needs to be addressed in these areas, you know, starting with institutional well-being. Uh, because institutions and business run the world now. And so if we start with institutional quality of leadership in, in institutions that focuses on well-being, then it is distributed. 
So on leadership also, we emphasize, uh, we have an acronym, LEADERS. L stands for look and listen and create a vision. E stands for emotional intelligence and emotional bonding. A stands for your state of awareness. D stands for dreaming but also doing. The other E stands for empowerment, distributed empowerment. R stands for responsibility. Leaders have to take responsibility for their own physical, emotional, spiritual well-being and then actually not only take responsibility but help their colleagues to do that. And S stands for what we call synchronicity, which is a spiritual experience where you see God's grace, divine protection comes from spiritual practice. So there are methodologies to predict well-being and the future of well-being. When the Arab Spring occurred, we were able to predict that it was going to occur. Actually, something that I can talk about now is I used to teach uh, corporate well-being and, and uh, leadership at Kellogg Business School. And this is many years ago, over a decade ago. Um, and uh, one day I got a call from the State Department during the, during the uh, Obama administration. And I was told that uh, Gaddafi's uh, son was going to be in my class and he was going to be escorted by the CIA and the FBI. Uh, they had a professor at Georgetown University from Libya who was actually part of the government, uh, State Department, and working for the CIA. I said, why is he attending my class? And I was told that uh, we had predicted that Libya was going to fall based on well-being. So if the score of well-being falls, total well-being in the country falls to less than 5%, we can say there's going to be a revolution. Everything is connected to well-being. Hospital admissions, crime rate, social unrest, all economic, it's all connected to well-being in the way I've described. And so you can predict what's going to happen. And we had already predicted that Libya was going to fall. So I have my question with the State Department was, uh, why is he attending the course? And you know, every country has their own foreign policy and self-interest. And they said, we want to make sure Libya does not fall because there will be consequences for everybody, including the United States. So he's coming to your class. So anyway, he was actually one of the most smartest students in the class, very engaged and uh, very aware. And at the end of the class, I was told that I was going to go to Libya to meet Gaddafi and you know restructure the well-being uh, um, strategy for the country. Three weeks later, before I could go, Gaddafi was dead and so was this boy from my class. So it was that accurate. So well-being predicts everything that happens in the society. Do not underestimate the value of well-being. And well-being is not just your blood pressure. It's not just your cholesterol level. It's not just your heart rate variability or your immune function, although all those are also related. Wellness is related to overall well-being, physical, emotional, spiritual, corporate, social, and economic, all connected. Everything that happens in a society, everything that happens, whether it's at peace, social unrest, violence, hospital admissions, all are connected to well-being. So please uh, be aware that this is more than taking somebody's blood pressure or measuring their immune function, although all of that is also related. So right now, as we look at uh, the future of well-being, 
one thing has become very clear and that is that every experience a human being has, every experience influences their biology at some level. So right now as you're listening to me, your cerebral cortex over here is very active, which means neurons are connecting with each other over here. And, uh, and there are neural networks that are firing. And how does that happen? Through actually the activity of genes in your cerebral cortex. And this is a new science. It's called epigenetics. So above your genes, there's a sheath of proteins called histones. And DNA is wrapped around them. And every experience you have, doesn't matter. Physical experience, emotional experience, spiritual experience, um, sleep, nutrition, exercise, yoga, breathing, any experience you have, it influences the activity of your genes. It influences the activity of your genes through a mechanism that switches genes on and off. So, and there are precise uh, biochemical triggers for this, methylation, deacetylation, on and on. But right now, your genes over here are active. If I can briefly share with you what we might call a handy model of the brain. This is a handy model of the brain, pun is intended. So this is the cerebral cortex, okay, where I am. It looks like the cerebral cortex also. And this is our intellectual brain. And this gets activated during intellectual conversations, during reflection, during meditation, during mindfulness, during anything that uh, involves intellectual ac activity, uh, insight, intuition, creativity, your cerebral cortex gets activated. If you if I open my hands, you see where my thumb is? That's the emotional brain. So the cerebral cortex, the intellectual brain, evolved about four million years ago in primates, in mammals, and in human beings. Of course, in human beings, it took an exponential leap in evolution uh, about only 40,000 years ago when we started to speak in language when we started to speak with stories, models, the intellectual brain grew explosively. And then written language is only 5,000 years old. You know, Sanskrit, uh, Aramaic, Hebrew, these languages may be 5,000, 6,000 years only. Oral language is about 40,000 years. So th this brain grew explosively when we develop written and oral language, 5,000 years plus. Human beings have been on this planet for only 200,000 years. And planet or uh, life on this planet has been there for almost 4 billion years. So human evolution as we know it is only, is only 200,000 years. And during this period, this brain has developed. But if I open my hand, we see where my thumb is. This is where the emotional brain is. Emotional brain is found in all mammals, all mammals. The word mam mammal comes from the word mama, mother. So mammals, unlike reptiles, they don't lay eggs. They, they deliver babies. They breastfeed. They have emotional engagement with their babies and with their significant others. And this emotional relationship is very important for our development, for our physical development, for our brain development as well. So if a mother or of a parent or siblings, there's a lot of attention, affection, appreciation, gratitude, acceptance, then you have a healthy uh, emotional uh, development of the brain. And this is very important for self-regulation or what we call homeostasis. So when there is emotional trauma of any kind, then 
there is uh, what we call lack of emotional maturity in the limbic brain. This is called the limbic brain. And that leads to inflammation, leads to depression, leads to actually the switches in genes that cause dysfunction in both our human genes and our microbial genes that causes disease. So actually, you know, when people say that caring doctors, you can have two kinds of, you know, you have two patients, identical disease, but they see two different doctors, they get identical treatment, they can have completely different outcomes. So one person gets better, one person doesn't, or one person even has mortality. A lot of it is the relationship between the doctor and the patient. So if the doctor has empathy and compassion and actually even feels love for their patient, something that we were not taught in medical school. You know, you have to be neutral, you have to be objective. Not so. If a doctor has empathy, which means they feel what the patient is feeling, if they have compassion, they have the desire to alleviate suffering and they feel love actually for their patient, then there's a mechanism in the, in the limbic brain. It's called limbic resonance, which means your limbic brain of the doctor and the limbic brain of the patient, they resonate. And once they start resonating, that leads to something called limbic regulation, which means the, the doctor starts to regulate the neural networks of the patient. And finally, there's actually a shift in the neural networks called limbic revision. So limbic resonance, resonance limbic regulation, and then limbic revision in that the neural networks rewire themselves for homeostasis and self-regulation and therefore healing. So when they say love heals, it's not a metaphor anymore. It's a biological phenomenon and it works through limbic resonance and epigenetic switches. And this is science. We cannot ignore it. Okay, why do some people get better and some people get worse? Now, you know, 1988, I wrote a book called Quantum Healing, which was uh, actually vilified and criticized by quantum physicists. Said, what is he talking about biology? Um, what does he know about quantum physics? And, you know, it took 35 years now, and we are actually, um, my next book is Quantum Biology, Quantum Body, written with quantum physicists because the principles, mathematical principles of quantum physics are very applicable to what happens in our biology. When we don't understand something, we dismiss it. You know, we say it's placebo effect. And then, okay, placebo, but how does the placebo work? Is there a biological process? And this is something that doctors have ignored. Physical lists have ignored. They dismiss it, placebo. But actually, every experience that you have met is, shapes the metabolism of your body. I remember, actually, in my early days when I was uh, very active in internal medicine and neuroendocrinology, I was studying the molecules of emotion, things like serotonin and dopamine and opiates and oxytocin. These are actually neuropeptides that are secreted by your brain as a result of your emotions. So wherever an emotion goes, molecule follows. Okay, these neuropeptides which are secreted in the brain also are immunomodulators and they actually influence your endocrine function, cortisol levels, adrenaline, and everything else from serotonin, opiates, oxytocin, they're all fine-tuned the immune system. When people say I have a healthy immune system, it doesn't mean their immune system is very over-aggressive. Your immune system is over-aggressive, you will have autoimmune illness or you will have uh, allergies and so on. If your immune system is 
non-responsive, you will get infections. You might be predisposed to cancer. So your immune system has to be fine-tuned for homeostasis, which means neither too aggressive nor too under-responsive. It has to be fine-tuned and that requires healthy emotions. So I remember one episode. I was looking at a patient's chart and uh, I told the patient, uh, uh, Mr. Smith, I'm sorry to inform you, but you, it looks like you may have uh, some kind of leukemia. As soon as I said that, I could see the patient's demeanor change, his facial expression change. He was crestfallen, his body language changed. I'm sure if I looked at his blood pressure, it was high. Heart rate variability changed. I'm sure cortisol, adrenaline levels went up. But then as soon as I said that, I also realized that I was looking at the wrong chart. So I apologized to the patient. I said, I'm so sorry, <coughs> this is not your chart. Immediately, his biology changed, immediately. Okay, suddenly he was smiling, facial expression changed, tone of voice changed, blood pressure changed, heart rate changed. That instantly, this is called quantum biology. Every experience is changing your body instantly, instantly, not with time. So if I tell you, you lost all your savings, stock market collapsed, or somebody ran off with your money, immediately your blood pressure will go up, okay? Immediately. On the other hand, if you fall in love, immediately oxytocin will go up. So this is what we call qualia medicine, not quantitative medicine. Quantitative medicine is when you measure things. Qualia is the quality of experience. And your experiences shape your biology moment by moment, not over time, moment by moment. And by the way, this is the basis of Ayurveda. Ayurveda is a qualia medicine, quality of experience, whether it's through the five senses or through meditation or through lifestyle or through diet or through vagal activation, or through yogasana, or through pranayam, you're influencing the quality of your experience. So there's a phrase in Ayurveda. It says, if you want to know your experiences in the past, just look at your body now. If you want to know what your body will be in the future, then look at your experiences now because we metabolize our experiences into our biology. Every experience, emotional, spiritual, physical, instantly influences your biology, instantly. This is a science we have to embrace. So right now the fashion, I will say trend in well-being is based on the following insight. Less than 5% of all chronic disease is genetically predetermined through what we call uh, fully penetrant genes. So if somebody has, and you probably, as doctors you know that, somebody has a BRCA gene for breast cancer, they're going to get breast cancer. It predicts it. And even for that, you know, we will soon have gene editing. So you'll be able to read the barcode of a gene through AI. And you'll be able to select the defective gene. You cut it and you paste the correct gene. And that should actually take care of genetically predetermined genes. Already CRISPR is approved for sickle cell anemia already. You can actually do gene editing and cure sickle cell anemia. But soon, gene editing will be available for cancer, for other diseases as well, heart disease and autoimmune illnesses. But what you have to remember is that only 5% of disease is genetically predetermined. 95% of disease is 
actually influenced by epigenetics, the quality of your experiences. 95% is influenced by the quality of your experiences. Here are the most important things that influence homeostasis in your body. Number one, sleep. Lack of sleep is now considered one of the most important risk factors for premature death from cardiovascular disease because lack of sleep causes dysbiosis, it causes inflammation, it causes anxiety, it causes depression. Sleep is very important, both dream sleep and deep sleep. This is during the sleep is when your body detoxes both emotionally and physically. Number two is what we call mind-body coordination. So mind-body coordination is not simple exercise. Mind coordination occurs when you practice yoga or you do pranayam because each of the asanas, they stimulate a specific branch of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a part of our parasympathetic nervous system and when it gets activated, it brings about again self-regulation and homeostasis. So pranayam, yoga, tai chi, qigong, martial arts, these are mind-body techniques, much more than exercise. Okay, so that's the second thing that is very important in self-regulation. The third is exercise. You know, if you walk 10,000 steps and these days everything is measurable, you can measure your sleep, you can measure your exercise. And also one of the things that happens as we age is sarcopenia. Sarcopenia means your muscle mass and muscle strength gets decreased. So if you activate your muscles through exercise, through uh, some kind of flexibility as in yoga or even strength training, you increase muscle mass. That is very important for your mitochondrial health. And mitochondrial health is determines longevity. So it's not only how long you live, but how healthy you are as you live. Only 3% of the genes that we know for Alzheimer's are fully predictable for dementia. The remaining genes are epigenetically influenced and exercise is a very important part of it. So in addition to mind-body uh, coordination, exercise is very important, activating genes in your cerebral cortex but also in your mitochondria. The fourth thing is nutrition. If you have a diet that is, uh, has maximum diversity of plant-based foods, vegetarian diet, and uh, has uh, all the seven colors of the rainbow, and uh, the six tastes of life, sweet, sour, salt, bitter, pungent, astringent, then you have maximum diversity of what are called phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are smart nutrients derived directly from the energy of the sun and responsible for all life on our planet. So a diet that has maximum diversity of plant-based foods, colors, seven colors of the rainbow, vegetarian thali. Think of a vegetarian thali. That is the best diet for your microbiome, which is two million genes in your body, which are microbial, not human. You have only 25,000 human genes, okay? But you have two million microbial genes. And if your genes are the software of your body, then, and your body is the 3D printout, then you can change the software of your body 99%. And the 25% that's human, you can upgrade it through meditation and mindfulness and we passed now. We did a one year retreat, um, no, a one week retreat in the year 2012. At the end of it, uh, we measured gene expression. This study was published in Nature, peer reviewed journal. We had a Nobel laureate as part of our, uh, our team, Elizabeth Blackburn, who discovered the enzyme telomerase. In one week, all the genes that were responsible for self-regulation and homeostasis went up some 17-fold over baseline. All the genes responsible for inflammation went down, including Alzheimer's, cancer genes went down some significantly, 17-fold. The level of the enzyme telomerase went up by 40%. Nobody believed the study when we first did it, but we had a very good team. 
Harvard, uh, USC, Chopra Foundation, University Mount Sinai. The team was amazing, including Nobel laureates. So the study was accepted by nature and now it's been replicated. So you can change your gene expression. That's the most important thing. And nutrition is a very important part of it. And then of course emotions, biological rhythms, circadian rhythms, these are all important. But overall, the message is change the quality of your experiences in the direction of empathy, compassion, love, joy, and equanimity, what in Buddhism we call the divine emotions, and you will change your biology. This is a very brief summary of where the future of well-being is going. Right now, the emphasis is on health span and lifespan. So if we take care of epigenetic modulation and gene expression, it is predicted that you should be able to live over 100 years and chronic disease should be optional. And if you choose, then the rishis were right. You should die in Mahasamadhi by choice when you want to. Okay, been there, done that. Thank you very much. We had. <laughs> So a life that is full of joy is the only solution to both mental distress and physical uh, uh, illness. We, we struggle these days with mental illness, this, that. The answer is not another pharmaceutical. The answer is not even mental intervention, not even, not even psychotherapy. Um, the answer is using AI to measure well-being and then actually using the best modalities to change your gene expression. The only answer is joy. If you don't have joy in your life, which is called Ananda Shakti, if you don't have Ananda Shakti, life is a waste. There's no point in living life. Joy is the only measure of success enjoys the only measure of well-being. Thank you. That was really profound. Thank you. I'm sure a lot of us have questions. So. Deepak Ji Pranam. I am aware that Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was your guru. I am totally changing uh, your topic of the talk because you had enough of medical uh, this thing. My question is, what is the importance of guru in our life? And then there is a lot of confusion uh, whether uh, how to find, how to connect with a guru. The only guru you can actually trust is somebody who doesn't want to be a guru. <laughs> the moment you want to be a guru, ego takes over. Okay, so in, in our traditions we say the highest guru is Upa Guru. Upa Guru is higher consciousness. Maharishi was my guru for sure. He pointed the way. But a guru cannot give you enlightenment. A guru can point the way. And then it's up to you. Okay. I think the days of amazing gurus like Ramana Maharishi like Atmananda Krishna Menon, like even J. Krishna Murti Ji, who did not want to be a guru but was. Those are very rare people, Vivekananda, Rama Krishna. So we should not take the topic of guru too lightly. Okay. And I would say trust your instinct 
and the guru can be a catalyst for your growth. Certainly in my case, Maharishi Ji was the catalyst. And not only did he point the way, but he introduced me to some amazing scholars, both here and in the West. And because of that scholarly introduction to Vedanta, to Kashmir Shaivism, to Buddhist uh, thinking, I really benefited from my guru. you comment me or somebody else taking Gandhi as a role model? It was not only Gandhiji as the ideal role model, as a visionary leader with authenticity, integrity, a higher purpose and responsibility, but the people around him, you know, from Vallabhai Patel to Pandit Nehru, before that, Motilal, to Rajendra Prashad. These were extraordinary people. Okay? These were statesmen philosophers. And Gandhiji brought them as a group. Even Jinnah, he struggled with it, but he looked up to Gandhiji. So this was an extraordinary time. And, you know, uh, it was a great vision. If you want to read uh, um, a, a speech that is life transforming, it is Pandit Nehru's speech on, on India's freedom, uh, freedom at midnight, where he created a vision for India, including IIT and All India Institute, which I have benefited from. He spoke about technology. He spoke about actually how India's future dependent both on science and spirituality. So the luminaries that were responsible for India's independence, the names I've mentioned, you have Rajendra Prashad as the president and he's an authority on Bhagavad Gita at the same time. Unbelievable era which uh, actually sparked India's influence in the world. Today, India is a cultural icon in the world. It's not just Bollywood. It's not just the food. It's not just the entertainment. It's not just the music, but it's the science. Look at all the, the companies in the world where the CEOs are from India. They trained in IIT. Whose vision was that? That was the vision of the statesmen, philosophers, that created uh, India's independence uh, under the two leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. So I think we owe a great debt to Gandhiji for being a leader with the highest integrity and the highest calling. And uh, today India is colonizing the world. India has never colonized the world through violence, but it is doing so through science, through technology, through spirituality, and through its great uh, talent, which actually goes back to India's independent, independence days, the vision that was created.
हेलो ओम नमः शिवाय सर मेरा नाम मुनीष सिन्हा है मैं आपको पिछले 20 साल से फॉलो कर रहा हूँ ऑनलाइन और हर जगह पे मैं आपको सुनता और देखता हूँ आपने मेरी पूरी लाइफ चेंज कर दी सर हम लोग मैं और मेरी वाइफ हम लोग पहले कॉर्पोरेट में थे एम करके जॉब कर रहे थे जब से आपको सुना हम लोगों ने अपनी कॉर्पोरेट की जॉब छोड़ी और पिछले 20 साल से समाज सेवा कर रहे हैं जितना भी आता है उतना ध्यान बता रहे हैं बच्चों को गरीब बच्चों के लिए काम कर रहे हैं सच में पूछो तो सर मेरे लिए आज पूरी जिंदगी का सबसे बड़ा दिन है कि मैं अपने गुरु को अपने सामने देख रहा हूँ आप हमारे लाइव गुरु हैं सर लाइव गुरु हैं आपने हमारी पूरी जिंदगी बदल दी हम एक ऑर्गेनाइजेशन चला रहे हैं परम्परा योग के नाम से आपने एक बार छोटा सा वीडियो अपनी लाइव में परम प्राण योग के बारे में उसको स्पेल किया था और लोगों को बोला था कि प्लीज़ इसको देखिए वो वीडियो अभी तक मेरे पास रखा हुआ है 20 साल से सर मैं आपको फॉलो कर रहा हूँ जैसे कि एक चकोर चांद को देखने के लिए तरसता है मैं वैसे आपको देखने के लिए तरसता रहता था आज मैं अपने भगवान को देख रहा हूँ आपने मेरी पूरी लाइफ चेंज कर दी सर मैं अपनी वाइफ अपने बेटा तीनों को लेके आया हूँ जब भी आपका सो जहाँ होता है दो घंटे पहले पहुँच के आपका वेट करता हूँ शायद आपको पता भी ना होता हो लेकिन आप हमारे गॉड हैं गॉड हैं सर थैंक यू सो मच ओम नमः शिवाय मैं एक स्पिरिचुअल टीचर हूँ लेकिन सर जहाँ भी मैं स्पीच देता हूँ जहाँ भी मैं मेडिटेशन सिखाता हूँ मैं सी आई एफ सब सी आई सब जैसे ऑर्गेनाइजेशन को ध्यान बता रहा हूँ सब आपसे सीखा है आपको पता भी नहीं लेकिन मैं कितने लोगों की जिंदगी आपके थ्रू पर चेंज कर रहा हूँ हैप्पी हैप्पी गुरु पूर्णिमा सर थैंक यू सो मच मुझे सर एक मौका आपका पैर छूने के लिए चाहिए होगा सर नहीं नहीं जस्ट जस्ट सर आई वांट टू टच योर फीट नहीं नहीं सर दैट्स सर एक ही मैसेज है योगस्त गुरु कर्मान दैट्स इट थैंक यू थैंक यू सो मच सर थैंक यू सो मच ओम नमः शिवाय सर ओम नमः शिवाय destiny talks about coincidences that there is nothing coincidental and you have also talked of full contact living could you elaborate a little on that yes so synchronicity is an english word which combines two basic concepts chronos means time and synchronous means synchronized in time this is the nature of our consciousness which orchestrates everything simultaneously and synchronistically as we move into the era of quantum biology it becomes very obvious that our bodies our biological organism not only your biological organism is human but every biological organism is an example of synchronicity that means while our mind thinks in linear terms cause effect which we call karma or whatever that's the mind but our spirit or our consciousness is not linear it is synchronistic how does a human body play a sitar think thoughts play a piano kill germs remove toxins make a baby all at the same time see it's all happening simultaneously your body is not functioning one thing at a time it is synchronistic and we can say meaningful coincidence because coincidence means many incidents simultaneously correlated so in physics this is now called entanglement quantum entanglement your body is not linear it is synchronistic but in order to experience that synchronicity you have to go beyond the mind so mind is linear cause effect karma etc we also call it karmic bondage but if you go deeper dharna dhyan samadhi then you tap into synchronicity and your life becomes what we call god's grace that is synchronicity 
morning, Dr. Deepa. Thank you so much for a very illuminating talk. I think we'll all take wonderful messages home today from what we've heard today. Uh, my question to you is, as you say, you're talking about well-being. Well-being begins with an individual and then it expands to the society's well-being. So what do you say about our education system, which has, uh, you know, just copied from the West and we've moved away from our, uh, you can say, heritage and from our uh, principles of, uh, you know, um, uh, guru and shishya. That has moved away. Has that brought about the ills of society that we see? That our education system needs to be totally revamped. I'd like your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, individual well-being and social or societal well-being are entangled. They influence each other. So your well-being contributes to collective well-being, but the collective well-being influences your well-being too because we are part of society, so they're correlated. As far as the education system is concerned, the system of education that deals with information is probably going to be slightly obsolete with AI and artificial intelligence and all the information. You can look up anything you want these days. Okay, so information overload is actually a problem in society. You have too much information and not selective. You don't even know which information is correct, which news is correct, because what we call news is all biased, all biased. Okay, it depends on who's doing the news. So we do need a, a revamp of our education system, but it may not be what you said, the traditional guru-shishya relationship. It may be a, a more organized system of self-realization, where you begin to understand how your body operates, how your mind operates, how your spirit operates, and you actually are given the means to do that. And it does not have to be the traditional way because, you know, life evolves. And everything that uh, a guru could teach you, that too is available now. But yes, you do need trusted leaders. You need leaders who have authenticity, which means they don't pretend to be who they're not you know, which is a big risk in society with leadership, authenticity, total authenticity. Number two, integrity. Integrity means they deliver their promise. Number three, higher calling. And number four, responsibility. If we have that, integrity, authenticity, higher calling, then that should be our guru. That should be our guru. That should be the only criterion, integrity, authenticity, higher calling, and responsibility. Thank you so much, sir. I'm, I'm also very happy I came today to see you in person. So when I also started realizing in my life that there's something beyond just making money and just eating food, and I should see what is beyond that. So your, one of your book, which Mr. Bakshi gave me, was like a sort of thinking, okay, yes, this is what I should also be looking at, and I should uh, try to walk on this path. So I want to ask you one thing today is that when we, when we reach this stage, there are two options. Either one is like sort of going into a cave and meditate, and one is to be in the society and try to figure this out and then share your wisdom with others. So maybe I think this, uh, what I think is for you, I think is the second, second thing. So how, how, how was it for you? Like how was your internal journey and uh, you invested your whole life sharing what you've learned uh, 
and what you try to understand with others. So how should it be like? It should we be selfish and we should be just be with our own self and be in the internal journey or should it be the other way around and uh, if you can just speak well, something you about know, it. Well, you know, in our tradition, uh, there are four stages in life, four ashrams. First 25 years is education. Second 25 years is fame and fortune. Third 25 years is giving back. And fourth 25 years, fourth 25 years, hopefully at least 100 years of good life is self-realization. And the way to self-realization is karma yoga, bhakti yoga, yana yoga and raj yoga. Whether you go into a cave or stay here doesn't matter. Uh, it's your choice. Okay, uh, you can do yoga in a cave. But, I mean yoga means karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga and raj yoga. You don't have to go to a cave but if you like that's not a bad choice either. By request of the Nidhi Dhaban to please come on stage and give the vote of thanks. Um, you know, there are some moments when life changes. Um, they, they can come in a sort of explosive way, but sometimes when a person like you is causing that change to happen, it's like the gentle waves of ocean, which is kind of, you know, training your brain to be, and I'm getting goosebumps here. So it's uh, the last one, one and a half hour has been like the gentle waves of ocean which have been uh, transforming our brain without our even realizing what is happening. Uh, and uh, you're very right, you know, now, now seems to be the age of the next extraordinary leadership to emerge. The age where morphic resonance, quantum entanglement, uh, trans generational healing rather than trauma to become normal, normative and scientific. Uh, it's been, um, uh, and you know, it's all new age woo woo of the past which has become science of today. And uh, we often try to tell our children that uh, what you don't know becomes magic but as you progress on and try to figure out what's happening, uh, even that first step of figuring out the what, if not the how, opens up the way for science to step in. So science is nothing but mysticism demystified. Uh, and the last two years have been, or three years, have been very transformative for the world. Um, they have thrown up great things in a very traumatic manner, but time to heal now and move towards well-being. And um, as uh, you were saying, I'm going to just take this opportunity to present you with two books that I have written. Um, yeah, I, I requested Umang that I need this opportunity, but um, uh, this book is about self-discovery. Uh, the line that I wanted to bring out, as you said, love heals, and yet some of the things that matter the most are the ones that are invisible. Gravity, atoms, DNA, and love. With extreme gratitude to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We have over here the spirit of the last hundred years. This place has a magic which in the crowds of Darya Ganj becomes the monastery. When, once you enter the place, there's a different energy here. Um, this is a picture of the hospital as it started, the hundred year old hospital. So it's, it's our extreme honor to 
present you with this. Can I request Dr. Umang to do the honor, please? Final gratitude, sir. The final gratitude. The end of life comes too soon to let moments slip by. Each moment is shaping our life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I you. Thank you for you what he did not allow you to do. Oh, please, please. <laughs> Thank you. This God bless. God bless. Okay.